Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and I'm here with you on episode 140. Uh, I'm struggling a little bit of uh, hay fever today, uh, but uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, it's that time of year. Uh, this week, I had my my beekeeper put the hive together, and so uh, in the next few months, I'll be getting plenty of delicious local honey. Um, uh, made for me by my my little crew of bees out there, and I'll feel better. Uh, got some good questions today, and it makes me happy. Uh, I don't think I didn't as I looked them over. I don't think like I'll get very angry as sometimes I do when people ask me questions about things I can't stand. So let's begin. We got a question here from Joshua. Oh, before we start, reminder for those of you who can't watch the whole thing because your attention span is that of a honeybee or uh, my my grandson. Uh, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com, and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Joshua asks a question. In the early 90s to mid-2000s, there was a Russo-Australian boxer named Koistia Zua, ferocious in the ring. He credits much of his power and stamina to carrying a 16K kettlebell and sometimes 24K for an entire hour. He would change hands or positions as much as liked. <clears throat> Whilst he walked, he just would not set it down. Made me think of you right away. Yeah, anytime someone reads something that's crazy or lunatic, they, they think of me. That's quite an honor. Uh, I recently did this with 16K for 43 minutes. I was extremely surprised by some of the muscles that hurt. I never felt them before during an exercise. I transitioned from farmers to overhead to racked and at one point held the bell like a baby in one hand. Oh, that's not a bad idea. That'd be that'd be an isometric curl. That'd be interesting. What is your opinion on this type of training? Well, I've never gone for an hour. I have done this exercise uh, where you go suitcase carry, rack, waiter, or the opposite, waiter to rack to suitcase and then switch hands, waiter to rack, to suitcase, and you try to organize it up a bit. Uh, <clears throat> I know I've done it for 15 minutes because that's what Grace Cook said to do, and that's why we call it the cook drill. Um, I mean, it's the kind of thing you could do for 10 years, uh, you know, five days a week. By God, do it. Uh, it's like that one guy who does, he has those extremely light weights, and he just does, you know, he just does clean and press left, clean and press right with light, uh, with a light dumbbell. Well, maybe a little light to me. Uh, and he just does that like a thousand times. I mean, good for you. If that's, <clears throat> if you can do that workout, well, you're wired different than I am. Uh, you'd be an interesting person to go across, you know, uh, a continent with, uh, because you would have the focus to stay on target where a guy like me would want to go see the world's largest ball of twine or something. Uh, I think there's value to it. I do. Um, Anytime you can teach yourself uh, while doing loaded carries that the the spine is, uh, that there's this wonderful, is it twisty movement? As my, as my legs come forward, my whole body does that amazing spinal movement. It's, it's like throwing in a way. That's what makes us humans walk. And there's some, of course, it's a very complicated thing. It's extremely complicated how humans walk. Extremely. Um, you know, we've had for a hundred years devices that can uh, replicate hearing, you know, uh, speech, uh, all kinds of vision things, including even better vision than we have, you know, x-ray and uh, night vision and uh, video recorders and all that. But <clears throat> whenever you watch a robot uh, walk, it always looks wrong. Uh, we, we still haven't been able to replicate for robots how to walk. And I'm convinced, and this is just my little theory, that they don't have that, they don't, they're, they're trying to make them walk, you know, kind of like burp, 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 versus, you know, the way humans walk. Um, so anytime you do loaded carries, I think it's great for your spine, uh, for your spinal health a lot. I think it's great for whatever you want to call the area between your neck and your knees. Sometimes it's called the core or the column. And uh, obviously, too, I mean, it's it's a good way to train the whole body and remind your body about, you know, the, the gaps. So, yeah, I like it. 
an hour. I don't know about that, but I like the idea. So enough. Uh, and as all questions segue into, could this be a soul exercise for life? Yeah, absolutely. It could. Sure. That and clean and press, uh, that and squat snatch, uh, power clean and press. You know, there's, there's a bucket of exercises you could do. The problem is, why would you do it? Why would you even think about it? I, I ask that question all the time. Unless you're in some kind of like a gun pointed to your head, you you get perfect freedom to do. Most people have perfect freedom to do whatever they want. So, but I, I it's a good question and I appreciate it and uh, enjoy the drill. Try it for like 15 minutes, three days a week for a while. And if it's something you like to do, hell, knock it up to that hour, okay? And you might be smarter than me by the end of this. Okay, we have a question from Chris. I am in the process of losing weight, male, 33 years old, 5'10", 78K to 72K. That's a good range. As my cholesterol levels are astronomical. Okay, so that is, that's DNA. And he's, oh, he follows up. With a familiar history of heart disease. Okay, that's your DNA. And so I, I've got to be careful about anything you ask me here because I'm going to slide into medical advice. But one thing I think I'm real good about is that uh, when someone tells me about they're taking a, this kind of medicine or that kind of medicine, one of the things I like to really hone in on is the the family history. Because um, if your mom and dad had an issue, and it could be something like alcoholism, or it could be something like high cholesterol, well, then there's a chance that that's the, your your DNA flicks that switch. Um, the, the, the thing on alcoholism is this is, comes from my doctor, Dr. Brunetti. He was explaining an interesting thing about, uh, there's been some discussion among doctors about the problem with uh, wisdom teeth removal and getting kids on different uh, painkillers after some of the kids get their switch flicked uh, on uh, from wisdom teeth. I, I just, it was like one of those things where, wow, that's, I, that's fascinating to me. Uh, I have switched to a pescatarian diet for those of you who don't follow. That means uh, fish is his uh, go-to source of protein. Okay. Uh, yeah, basically pescatarians would eat fish, uh, veggies, uh, fruits, you know, that kind of thing. Trying my best to reduce saturated fat. I feel and look great. Well, good for you, man. That's, that's great news. Uh, however, I can feel my press strength declining slightly over the course of weight loss. Okay. Just to let you know, uh, Chris, I walk with you when I, when I lost all that weight, uh, with easy strength for fat loss, my press went down. Squats and press seem to have a correlation with flat out body weight. Uh, and that's my knock on creatine. And I got not, I mean, I don't have anything against it, but people say, well, my bench and my squat went up. Well, of course it did. You added, you know, you added 10 pounds of body weight. You know, I hope your bench and squat go up because otherwise what are you doing this for? Um, and it troubles me because I put so much effort into growing it. I've pressed two 28 K bells for three reps. And now I struggle with two, two reps. Okay. I know it seems small, but it feels like a big deal because I'm chasing the body weight strict press. On the other hand, my squats and sprints feel much stronger. Uh, okay. Okay. And that, that would sometimes people squats improve, um, <clears throat> with body weight losses, uh, because, um, they can move into the space better. And I'm not saying, you, but if you have, I mean, if you're a power lifter, it probably helps to have a big gut. I think from what I've seen, because you can kind of bound that belly off the thighs a little bit. I don't know if that's legal, but it certainly seems like it's something I see sometimes. <clears throat> I know that sounds a little weird, but, uh, and as you lean out sometimes, especially if you do front squats or overheads, you, it's a little easier to slide between the legs. Question. Could you elaborate on your experience with weight loss and strength levels? Are some lifts uh, movements affected more than others? And are there important factors to consider? You know, I, I think we've discussed it already. For me, my press suffers when I lose uh, body weight. You know, I was pressing the beast. That's the 48K bell. I mean, I was pressing it like it wasn't even on there for a long time. And then when I leaned out, it was like I went from... 13 reps with my right arm. I don't know how many I can do now, but it was, it's not 13 anymore. Uh, when I'm working, when I'm getting my weight down for an Olympic lifting meet, I notice my lockout goes in my jerk, uh, my lockout. But I read, I looked at all the videos. I rethought my training. I realized 
it wasn't my jerk. It was my clean that was not appropriate for the kind of jerk I was doing. So it's kind of funny. So basically what I'm saying is, I think it's better that you lose the weight, but just keep in mind that there's going to be uh, challenges coming up. You'll probably find your pull-up goes up when you lose weight. I mean, obviously. And your press goes down. So your shoulder health is probably going to be a little bit better because your pull-up went up. Uh, but your press might have gone down. And don't worry too much about it. For you, it seems to me, and I apologize for all these noises, uh, you got to take care of your health, man. And uh, uh, if you can't press the, the bell as much as you want to, but you your your numbers are in better shape, that's a win-win for you. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Gary, and it's a good question. In fact, I followed up on it and uh, did a little extra for you. I know that you buy fresh-made kimchi from a local Korean market, but living in Scotland, I'm not exactly spoiled for choice when it comes to local Korean markets. Well, sure. I am aware that the supermarket fermented foods are pasteurized and contain no live bacteria. I... I I don't know if that's 100% true. We we can find some here where I live. But there's a much easier answer before I even go online. Before I even... Is it so easy to make your own sauerkraut, uh, Gary? I would suggest you thinking about that. Uh, basically, and I have a video. Didn't I make a video of this somewhere? Either on Instagram or on my YouTube channel of me making sauerkraut. Um, but uh, I mean, it comes down to this. You get heads of cabbage... You finely shred them or chop them down. Uh, you can put any herbs you want into the bottom of the, the big mason jar. You, <laughs> you, you, you take the shredded uh, uh, cabbage and you, you, you kind of mush it down a little bit. Uh, I use my fists, but you're supposed to use a thing, but it doesn't matter. And then you add a, just a hint of salt. There's so much less salt than you would think uh, in a kind of a, a light brine. And then you just shove all that into a mason jar and then put a cap on. Uh, I do, do use the little uh, uh, rubber gaskets that are nipples that'll allow the excess to come out. Um, gosh, seven days, eight days from them, you got your own kimchi. Uh, I've done all kinds of variations. I've done red and Napa kimchi, uh, pardon me, sauerkraut, red and Napa cabbage sauerkraut. I've done uh, I've done it with caraway seeds. I've done it with oh gosh uh, ginger, which was surprisingly interesting because the ginger seems to ferment a little bit too. Uh, garlic, uh, I didn't even notice. I think the garlic was just sitting there on the bottom, just festering. I don't know what it was doing. And then uh, that so that's just a real simple idea for you. If you type in make your own sauerkraut, I'm sure there's a thousand people showing you. I have found raw and unpasteurized sauerkraut online at a reasonable price. My question is this. Do you find kimchi to be superior to sauerkraut for gut health, or is it just a case of personal preference and availability? For me, um, I like my own sauerkraut. My red sauerkraut's a little rubbery. Uh, pardon me. Yeah, my red cabbage sauerkraut's a little rubbery. But then I went over this place here, this German place, and had theirs. And they clearly add sugar to theirs because I could taste the sugar in it. Um, but I'm not going to add sugar to my sauerkraut. I don't know what that would do for the fermentation. I don't maybe turn into booze, <laughs> get drunk on cabbage wine. Oh yeah, that, there's there's a there's a thought. Um, I get the kimchi because the nice lady at the Korean market knows who I am now, and when I get in there, she always she she runs and gets me my own gallon. So. That's that's quite nice. She's impressed about how I go through a gallon of kimchi a week. So, uh, is there anything else I should be looking for on the label other than raw and unpasteurized to make sure I'm getting the maximum benefit? Yeah, I don't know what the words raw and unpasteurized mean. I, I don't know. Since I make my own, it's raw and unpasteurized, but I don't know when you buy it uh, when you buy it from somebody else. I, I mean, I know what pasteurized means. I know what raw means. But in this particular case, um, the stuff that makes cabbage turn into sauerkraut, that, lacto that lactate, I mean, that stuff will burn up anything. I mean, I, I, I don't know if the bubonic plague could last in a sauerkraut jar. This, it's, from what I've read, it, it's, a brutal it's a brutal environment in there. 
Uh, so you don't have to worry too much about germs. Uh, stuff will float to the top sometimes. I, I've never had an issue, but people have told me you can get green, black, red, and uh, white mold. I guess white's okay, and I guess there's another color that's okay. I've never had it, and if I do, the first thing I... I'd probably throw it away just to err on the side of right, but some people do these little sm small things to fix it, but I, I don't know what it means. I do like the, I do, I like the fact that you're buying some. When you mention you take an apple with the kimchi, what are the benefits of doing this? Um, and then it says, finally, how big are the servings in your biome breaks? So what I did for you, uh, Gary, is I took a picture. And if you go to, I'm on Instagram on Coach Dan John. And if you go there, one, so it's one word, Coach Dan John. And just scroll back and you'll see one, the one that has the glass of carrot juice. That's the one I, uh, I shared with you today because you're Scottish. So I have some porridge in there, uh, some oatmeal for, for everybody else listening. Uh, oatmeal and I also have seeds in the oatmeal. I love I think the chia seeds, C-H-I-A. Now, listen, after the book Born to Run came out, everyone started thought, thinking it had miracle benefits. I, I don't use it for the miracle benefits. I like the fact that they swell up almost 10 so times in size when you add it, but they get they save the... I find them tasteless, but they get the flavor. So uh, I noticed this morning, because I use vanilla protein in this particular thing, that I tried one little chia seed, and it had a hint of cinnamon and a hint, hint of vanilla, which I thought was kind of cool. So it sucked the taste up. Um, so there's carrot juice, there's blueberries, there's uh, radish kimchi, there's Napa cabbage kimchi. Oh, and there's oranges. So the blueberries are because my daughter bought blueberries last night. There's oranges because my neighbor's uh, doing a fundraiser for his swim team and they sold cases of oranges. So I have a ton of oranges in my house right now. Honestly, come on, bye. So basically what I focus on there, Gary, is just whatever in-season fruit or whatever fruit I have on hand. Um, I don't know how to say the guy's last name, but I think the book is I think the book is called Fiber Fueled by Dr. Will. And there's a B and then just a ton of consonants behind it. Whatever. Fiber Fueled, Dr. Will with one L and then a B. And I really like that book. Of course, you know I've been I've been focused on fiber as you know uh, since 1971 or 1972 when I read an article in Reader's Digest about the importance of fiber. Fiber, you know, in my world, it's protein and then veggie fiber. You know, those are the to me those are and then water. That's the magic foods. I do like the fermented foods, and I got on that a while ago when when the gut biome thing really hit about 2013 2000. To 17 is when the, the research first talked about it and now it's everywhere um of course the probiotics you know you take gummies that have probiotics and that's all that um so you can see so the reason i i mentioned in the uh, in the powerpoint presentation the the, the video on uh, Am, uh youtube about an apples because when i did that was in the fall and apples are really really accessible uh, that time of year here in Utah. In the winter, uh, citrus fruits, fruits, and really in the rest of the year, uh, we'll have a tomato season coming up pretty soon. Um, I think I count veggies as tomatoes. I can't remember what we're supposed to do, but I, I, I raise my own, I get my own tomatoes from my own garden. Uh, so I eat a lot of tomatoes in the midsummer because they're popping right off the vine for me. Um, whatever's in season is what I try to get. The farmer market over here uh, at Wheeler is going to be open up in a few months. I mean, they'll be uh, they'll have Utah pears there. They'll have watermelons, and that's that's kind of what I do. So whatever f local fruit you have. Now I know in certain parts of the world fruit is less common, but then then you should focus probably more on. And by the way, if you're eating the traditional Scottish diet of of fish, leeks, uh, the oatmeals, and uh, the the traditional grains of your area, I, I think you're okay too. Uh, I'm still a little bit of a believer in traditional foods uh, for people. Um, your mileage, of course, may vary. Thanks. That was a good, good, fun question. And remember, look at that picture. That's for you, okay? Okay, we got a question from John. A lot of people seem to approach rite of passage as a peaking program, 
but it seems to have been designed originally as a program you run over and over. I like Rite of Passage. So basically it comes down to lots of kettlebell clean and press left, clean and press right. I include the pull-up and then you finish off the workout with either kettlebell swings or snatches. And uh, it's all the, the presses and pull-ups are all done in ladder fashion. Uh, if you're at danjohnuniversity.com, if you just go to the RKC prep, it's I just spell it out for you as best I can, okay? Uh, I like the rite of passage, and I know you've used it a good bit, especially for prepping for the certs, right? And even made a variant, which I thought you might have some ideas. Is there something that needs to be tweaked to make it more sustainable program? I know you're a big fan of the big five. <laughs> That's funny. Squat, push, pull, hinge, loaded carry. I say push, pull, push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Yeah, threw me off. Do you think adding a set of front squats at the top of every ladder might be a good idea? Or is it best to save squats and carries for variety days? Well, when we did the five-day program, uh, our big variety day was loaded carries. But So maybe make that the Saturday, the last day of the week, the finisher of the week. And Tuesday, just do maybe just do front squats. But don't go crazy on them, you know. Uh, just do front squats on, say, Tuesday, whatever, you know, however you're working, I don't care. But don't be like, don't do like six sets of six with 80%, you know. Just just be reasonable. Might be a good idea to do like five sets of two, and that should be enough. I always recommend doing goblet squats for a rite of passage as a warm-up anyway. So that would make you squatting four days a week, three as warm-ups, and then the one look. That, that would probably, for most people, be enough, John. Um, do I think it's a great program? I don't know. I mean, it's pretty good, which if you know my work, I consider pretty good the highest standard. So yeah, it's pretty good. And sometimes pretty good is all you're going to get. So enjoy that. Okay. And thanks for the question. We have a question from Eli and Eli asks a good one with the passing of Louis Simmons, rest in peace. I have been going through and revisiting a lot of West side material. Louis talked a lot about the original West Side barbell in Culver City, California, run by Bill Peanuts West. Now, there's always been an argument if it's West Side, is it's the West Side of the country, or named after Bill West, being West. Now, Bill West tried anything and everything, and he really, uh, it's his ability to throw caution to the wind that I think really helped the establishment of West Side, but we'll, we'll go on. Louis says he found articles about them in a magazine in the early 1970s, and that's where he picked up box squats, deficit pulls, good mornings, and many other movements. I would just wonder if you're familiar with the original West Side. Yeah, there, in fact, I have. Uh, I can give you three quick stories. I used to work for a company called Bigger, Faster, Stronger. If you look at their videos, um, I do a set of 10 in the Power Clean for video. They only show one of them, but with 315 pounds in the, in the Power Clean. I also uh, jerk 385, 175 behind the neck for five. Uh, I don't know if that video, may, I think it's the, the 365, 165 kilos for five. I think that's the one they put. And uh, Greg Shepard uh, told me that he, he knew and worked with the original uh, group. And if you study bigger, faster, stronger, you'll see that it's a um, homogenized, cleaned up, uh, it's a cleaned up variation of the original West Side. Uh, so it's the towel bench. You know, you put a back back when we first started lift, we used to roll up towels, but then later we started using those uh, squishy foam. They're, they look like, well, yeah, it's it's what the people, um, you know, it's foam rollers. Yeah, foam rollers can be a. Oh, I don't have mine. <clears throat> foam rollers can be a wonderful <laughs> use. Finally, you can do. You can do foam roller bench press. Um, I think Louis came up with the the two by four. So you have the three two by fours, the one two two by fours, the one two by four. Um, so Greg Greg really shared a lot of that with me. Uh, the other big influence with me was a hammer thrower by the name of Pete Gallet, G A L L E with a hyphen on it. And uh, we were sitting at Sports Palace one day, and he just went through the whole box squat program. And he basically told me that the, the most important exercise, the, the answer to that question, if you could only do one thing, was the box squat. And uh, they used uh, two 
massively different variations of the box squat, according to him. And I, I don't have my notes anymore. Uh, my friend Jay has them, in fact, uh, from Pete, but I don't have them today. Um, uh, he, he would do high box squats and then extremely low box squats. And I don't think, I don't think I've really seen those as much. I think the low box squats disappeared. Finally, of course, you know, the other person I knew, and it wasn't a good relationship with a guy named George Friend, uh, an American hammer thrower. Um, but he, you know, he, you know, he was, uh, he did all that stuff. He did all that stuff. Uh, but, uh, he, yeah, yeah. But Pete was wonderful in explaining all this to me. And, and Greg's program, Bigger, Faster, Stronger, if you look at it, I mean, you'll see the, you'll certainly see uh, West Side adapted for a high school setting. And it's a good program for high schools, you know, if if that's what you're doing. Uh, I think in this day and age, I mean, we have Jim Wendler's 531. I would humbly brag <laughs> that some of my things I've introduced to high schools have worked well. Sadly, most high schools are still crappy bodybuilding programs. Um, but those that do take it seriously, those who do the 531, bigger, faster, stronger, um, they, they seem to have a lot of success. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. I know that uh, Louis really pioneered chains, but Greg came up with a, a thing to do with chains. He put, he sells chains that are collars. And the first time I saw that, I went, that is the most brilliant thing I've seen in the weight room in a hundred years. So in my, if you come to my gym, I just leave the, the squat rack always have chain, always, always has chains on it. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't think I've done a squat without chains. I mean, maybe a goblet squat or overhead squat, but I don't think I've done a squat without chains. And holy cow. That may maybe 30 years. I, I don't power lift. So it doesn't matter. So even when I'm getting ready for a weightlifting meet, um, I I said this before, I, I just ignore the chain. So, you know, if I've got 205 on there, I have a lot more weight than that. So, but it's good. It, you know, humbles me out a little bit and gets me going. Uh, the one thing about the West Siders that they're not, they, I mean, they're, they, they have one goal and it is to get you as strong as you possibly can in those big three lifts, uh, bench, squat, deadlift. Uh, my knock on West Side has always been this. When I'm watching a game with a West Sider, and I've done this many times, I always get the elbow, the big elbow. They're big guys, you know. And they say, I'll tell you one thing. If I was their coach, they'd be stronger. And I always respond, yeah, you'd be the strongest. You, you know, you'd be stronger, but would you win? Because that's just because you're the strongest on the, on the field doesn't mean you're going to win. It's an advantage, but never make that straight line across in uh, team sports. Or the throwing arts? I hope that helped, Eli. Good question. Thank you. We have a question from Mike. And Mike is, I'm a young plumber who is fairly active throughout the week. Most of my tasks uh, include digging for long hours, moving water heaters by hand, carrying heavy cast iron pipe, crawling around under mobile homes, <laughs> and carrying tools and equipment. I'm 25 and a Marine Corps vet with some aches and pains I've acquired from my time in the military, most notably my right knee and both elbows. I currently train an easy strength uh, program with kettlebells. My question today is, what specific programs and exercises would you recommend for me if my goals are to stay in good health and not have a ruined back and knees while being a plumber? Should I focus on strength, hypertrophy, or a little bit of both? I don't play any sports anymore, but I'm interested in trying out the Highland Games next year. Any thoughts would be helpful. Well, you know, the first thing is, you know, that wear and tear from the Marine Corps, uh, let's get that, let's get that fixed. Let's get that taken care of. I would suggest to you that you stick with easy strength with kettlebells, but always go for a 45 minute walk every single time. Uh, not only would it keep your body composition in check, but there is a certain tonic, uh, that you get from walking that seems to help every inch of your body. I'm, I don't know how healthy, uh, walking helps your ears, but it does. I don't know how Walking helps your eyesight, but it, it makes, there's the research on how it helps your spleen is clear. I just made that up, <clears throat> but stick with that. I would suggest as much as you can, uh, like if you can, if you can do half kneeling presses, uh, to get that hip flexor stretched. Um, and I don't care what, hand, if you have your left knee down, I don't care if it's in your left 
hand or right hand when you press, but you know, a couple, you know, three sets of three on both sides will give you a marvelous hip flexor stretch, uh, and it'll make you get up and down off the ground. Um, instead of doing pull-ups for a while until those elbows come around, just hang, just hang. So between sets of presses, just hang and let's let those elbows heal up a bit. Um, if you're doing swings, which I would suggest, um, just add like one goblet squat at the end of every set of swings. 15 swings, one goblet squat rest. Um, just to make sure that, so we're going to, we're going to use the kettlebell to get you, you know, to burn some fat, to make your lower back, you know, what are, what are the, what are the ad piece, you know, strong as, you know, in insert, you know, <clears throat> insert some hyperbole, uh, and then go for a walk. So half kneeling presses, hangs, swings. If you can, you're already doing loaded carries with your work. I don't think you need any more, but the walk, the walk after is the most important. Okay. And get, and as you get healthier, let me know. Uh, let's, let's continue. And you ask about strength, hypertrophy or both. Uh, we're going to focus on both at the same time, but let's put off that Highland gaming until your knees feel better and your elbows feel better. Highland games are tough on the elbows. I, I was fortunate not to have the issue, but so many of my friends would wear these massive elbow braces. Um, one of my good friends, of course, is no longer with us, but uh, he was always talking about them. That's why he didn't like rotating into the weight over the bar is because he was afraid most guys were going to blow their biceps and elbows apart. And it was weird when he said that because I was standing there going, you know, when you have that like, I don't know, this doesn't look right feeling. And you know, it's a situation of awareness and I had that situation of awareness. And it's like, this doesn't look right. And Jeff walked over and goes, I just don't think that's good for the elbows. And I'm like, that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> so enjoy and good luck. And thanks for sharing that with us. I want you to get back with me in a couple months of that. And let's go from there. Okay. We got a question from Akshay. Akshay. I am a 38 year old dad and of a three year old. Oh, good for you. I'm a doctor by profession, so I won't give you medical advice. <laughs> and work long hours. I train four or five days a week with kettlebells, three days of strength work with double clean and press and squats. Well, I like that. Good. And two days of swings and get-ups. I also make sure to walk a mile daily, too. Despite paying attention to technique and ensuring I don't have compromised form to complete a, a rep every year, I pick up some kind of injury. It's either the AC joint or the rotator cuff or something in my upper and mid back. I would like to know where I'm going wrong and how I can prevent these injuries. The, the one thing I would say, uh, once you turn 35 and had a, a baby, you, you might have wanted to slide down. Let's just try this idea. Now, I want you to walk every day. That, that, that's a given. But is there a chance, uh, Akshay, that you can uh, just lift three days a week? And the reason I'm saying this is I'm wondering if once you hit about 35, recovery ability lags off. And then having a, a child and long hours, I just see I just see maybe you're trying to burn that candle at a, a few too many ends all the time. And I, this is just, I, this isn't a given. I'm not 100% sure of this. But I'm wondering if the long hours, uh, your age, and the baby are all conspiring to you just having, and by the way, to hurt a joint, it, it's not a thousand, re okay, it can be a thousand reps, but usually it's just one. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I've driven a lot of miles on my car and I've never been injured in driving my car, but all I need is one accident and, you know, all of a sudden the rules change. So um, you might have one bad rep every two weeks and that's the one. I noticed that when I was pressing today, when, when I was pressing my left side, I was getting a little lazy and I, I swear I was locking out over here and I, I, I'm sure I wasn't, but I wasn't, I wasn't finishing my press with my bicep on my ear. And I'm like, and, and I, you always go through that moment, don't you know who I am? And then I was like, Dan, just do it right. And I just slid my bicep back to my ear, pause for another rep or two. And it was like, oh, that feels good. So maybe it could be just that simple. Let's think about this. Let me try this. Um, try three days a week for about two or three weeks for me, okay? 
And um, on day one, do the swings and get-ups as warm-ups for the, the double clean and press and squat stuff. On day two, do the double clean, press, and squats as a warm-up for a harder swing workout, finishing with some gobble squats. Day three repeats day one. Try that, and then, of course, the next week, it'll be, you know, it'll be just the opposite. Try that for may maybe two or three weeks and get a sense of things. Just see if there's <clears throat> any progress on this injury front, and then uh, uh, we can tweak back to maybe four days a week after maybe two or three more weeks, and then maybe slide back to this program. But let's just th see if the frequency is, is doing the damage versus the technique. Also, next time you email me this question, would you please send me, I would like, uh, I'd like to see a video of your get up and your double clean and press for sure. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Um, that was, that went smoothly. Um, remember if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'm, I'm here to answer them. I'm happy to do it. And I really appreciated this week's questions. Uh, you always can tell I like the questions is when I see it and I do a little extra work like I did with Gary's question about the, uh, about whatever, the breakfast or uh, the kimchi and stuff. Well, thank you. And remember, uh, until we meet again, let's keep on lifting and learning, okay? Thank you.